Hi guys, looks like we have a couple people that have joined so far. Maybe we'll get some more shortly. Uh, but welcome to the first session of the, uh, the live session for the class. <laughs> um, can you hear me okay? Check, check, just making sure I've got the audio working properly. Can you hear me okay? So for all these live sessions, um, I will of course prioritize any questions or concerns you might have. Um, obviously we'll focus on anything most relevant to the current week first, but if there are you no know, further questions regarding this week or previous week's material, then you can feel free to ask any other general effects questions as well if you'd like. And of course there are extra tips and tricks that I can share if there aren't any questions. Looks like we lost one of our people here. Um, it's like Helly Yulin. I don't know if that's your real name or not, but um, can you hear me? Hopefully the audio is working properly. Just want to get some confirmation before launching into some of these demos. All right, well, uh, if there is no confirmation, hopefully everything's working fine and we'll get into it. Um, so for this first session, there are a couple of fracture related uh, tips that I was considering going over. Uh, one of those would be regarding glass fractures and the other would be absorbing small pieces to attach them to nearby pieces. Um, so it's essentially treated as one piece. So you can take pieces like, you know, this little one here and have that be part of its nearest neighbor. So we'll probably go over that one first. Um, in week two, uh, we went over optimizing your fracture. Actually, sorry, maybe that's in week three. We talk about discussing the, or we talk about deleting all the tiny little pieces but we can talk about this bit of optimization here anyway. So to attach some of these small pieces to their nearest neighbors, we're going to start by filtering out the small pieces. Now I've created a measure fracture HDA that will calculate the bonding box size of each of those pieces and we'll connect our proxies to that. And this is something you would ideally do on your fracture geometry before you optimize it or do anything else to it. I'm just running it on the proxies so that it's a little bit faster to work with for our live session. But yeah, typically you would do this process on the original fracture and then generate the proxies afterwards. And don't worry, I know we haven't gotten to the proxy generation in the class yet, but we'll get to that shortly. That'll be the beginning of next week. So um, in this measure fracture HDA, I have a size threshold that I can use to filter out certain pieces. So if I lower this threshold, we can filter out just the small pieces. And for this, we want to go with something very, very small. Let's see if we go down to, let's see, 005 should be getting to some small pieces. Let's go even smaller than that. Looks like 0 0.002 looks like a reasonable candidate. And actually, let's uh, trim this down to a smaller subset of our building so that it's more obvious what uh, the end result is. So I'm going to just drop in a blast node to delete these based on their Y position. Looks like our Y range is from zero to 29. So in this group, I'll just do at P. Let's see, I forget if it's dot Y or sub one or if both of those work, but I'll delete everything that's greater than a value of, we'll say 10, and we'll have to set this to points in order for that to work. 
and we'll delete everything below a certain value as well. Maybe everything below a value of five. So at p.y is less than five. And let's run an exploded view on that just to see how many little tiny pieces we have here. So yeah, as you can see, there are lots of real little ones and um, it could certainly make our RBD sim a bit heavier to simulate all these tiny little pieces. There's no problem with simulating them if you're not running into problems with your sim times. But yeah, if you wanna optimize things and just save that, uh, that detail size for your particulate secondaries, then we can absolutely filter those out and attach them to their nearest neighbors so they're just one piece. Now, we probably don't wanna do this to the window frames. So I'm going to filter out the window frame pieces from our, our um, candidates before we run it into the measure fracture. The window frames have lots of little pieces and we don't really want to change those at all. And we certainly don't want a window piece attached to a wall or something like that. So you might want to run this in a loop and process each section of geometry separately. But for now, I'm just going to split out the, um, split out the window frames. So let's drop in a split node and I'll say at name equals window star, and that'll split out the window frames. So we can just use the second output for the pieces that we'll be processing. And you know what, let's do this uh, piece by piece instead of just doing everything uniformly. Because as I mentioned, it could get a bit weird if you have, for example, a piece of the interior that's attached to the exterior or something like that. So maybe we'll run a loop on this. And uh, if you, I don't know if you've gone through the week two material or not yet, but we're fracturing the building section by section. So we store the original name of the pieces when we fracture it. We should have name a ridge on here. Yep, we do. So we're gonna run a for loop for each named primitive, and we'll loop over name a ridge. So on this for each end, instead of name, that'll be name a ridge. And oftentimes when you change your for each loop, you have to reset cache pass in order for that to update. And let's do an exploded view for just this current piece to see what we're dealing with. Drop in, exploded view. All right, cool. looks like we have lots of little pieces, so we should see a pretty obvious result here. Now, for each one of our pieces in this loop, we're going to do this split we already set up to separate out the small little pieces. And we can then attribute transfer the name from our big pieces. So let's, uh, we're, we could transfer if we wanted to uh, from the pieces without unpacking them, but all of these packed objects have a point at their center. So if we drop in a null to view the second output there, and with a packed edit node, actually, sorry, these are not packed geometry yet, are they? Okay, yes they are, in this case. Um, if you're dealing with packed geometry, then you'll want to unpack it for fracturing, because as you can see, if we switch the packed object display to just a point per piece with that packed edit node and set the display as to point cloud, or we'll say centroid, um, this shows that that one point per piece not might not be a good, uh, it might give us a big transfer distance to go from a decent sized piece to the edges to absorb the smaller pieces. So we're going to unpack that geometry so we can actually transfer from the edges of our surface. Once again, this is a little more obvious if we go to exploded view. 
So if we want, for example, this piece to absorb this little one here, if we're transferring from the middle there, then there might be some other piece, uh, a smaller piece close to it with a closer centroid, and that won't be very accurate. But if we transfer from the very edges of our geometry, then any small piece that's next to it will be more accurately absorbed. So we'll make sure to run on Unpack Geometry. And right now our name attribute is on prims. So I'll transfer that name attribute. Actually, not. we don't want to transfer it. We just want to promote it down to points. So attribute promote, set it to set it to points, go from primitive to points, select the name. And now with that name attribute on points, we can transfer it over to our small pieces of geometry. So we're transferring from here to absorb all these little pieces. Now you could just do a quick attribute transfer and overwrite the existing names here. Actually, let's, um, let's do a promote for our other objects as well. These are all packed pieces on, on the small end of this here. Uh, you, you should definitely pack these because you want to make sure that each of these tiny little pieces only gets one transferred value. And a packed object is just you know, represented by one primitive, one point for each piece. And that'll ensure that since it's just represented by one point, it'll just pick up one value on that surface. If you were, you were to transfer names from the big to the small, um, if you were to transfer it onto unpacked geometry on the small pieces, then it's possible all the different points on your little pieces might get different names and you wouldn't be sure which one uh, you should use. So I like to do this on the packed geo. And let's, um, let's erase the name to make sure that we've transferred the name correctly. You could do the attribute transfer without clearing out the name attribute first. So if we just drop in our attribute transfer on our little pieces and transfer from our big pieces like so, then we have no real way of knowing if it has actually worked or not. It's not very obvious whether this is the old name or whether it's picked up a new name or something. So I'm just going to right click that spreadsheet, make sure it's always on top, and I'll clear out that name attribute before the transfer. So I'll say S at name equals, you could just make it an empty string or I'll just put in a hyphen here. So if we check the spreadsheet on that wrangle, you can see all of these names are empty. And with the attribute spreadsheet for our transfer node, if we bypass that, you can see these are empty here. And otherwise we have the new transferred names. And if you have um, an overly, or if you have too small of a transfer distance here, then it's possible some pieces might not pick anything up. Like if I shrink this down to 0.18, you can see there's this one piece here that hasn't picked up a name. That's why I like setting the names to something empty or some placeholder value before doing this transfer so that it's easy to find any of the pieces that have not received the new name. So let's see if we, um, you can either, increase this distance threshold to some really large value if you'd like, but more reliably you can just turn that off so that it doesn't really matter what that distance is and it'll always transfer that name. So now with that name transferred over, we can, uh, well I guess we can go to the end of the loop if you want to run it on everything, but in this case I think we'll just unpack that geometry and promote that attribute. So do an unpack and transfer our new names. And you can see because this name attribute was on points before, 
Uh, now we have the old name attribute on prims and the new one on points. And when you have uh, the same attribute on both prims and points, that's generally uh, to be avoided. It's not necessarily a huge problem, but it can confuse some pipelines, and I definitely recommend avoiding that if possible. So in this case, before we do the unpack, I'm going to promote this back up to prims. So we'll just drop in another attribute promote, set this from points to prims, and select the name. And you can see now we have the name attribute on our primitives. Now we ultimately want to repack our geometry because you can see all these pieces came in, at, or this came in as one packed object or I should say a series of packed objects for this hull. But yeah, we ultimately want to export one, one piece of geo here. Actually, uh, is this gonna work properly? Let me just double check and make sure that we have, yep, all right, we have enough different names on this one name or ridge section. So that's okay. I'm going to unpack the geometry on the left, or on the right here. And then we'll just merge in our objects with the different names here. Merge those together. And then if we pack this up by name once again, just drop in another pack, turn on that name attribute like so. And let's do an exploded view to check the results. So on our exploded view, we want to make sure it's exploding it by name. Let's see, is this working properly? Let's compare the exploded view from the very beginning here. See what this looks like. Hmm, let's see, did we, oh, I see what we did. When we did our unpack here, we didn't uh, promote our names uh, back up to primitives. Let's see, what do we do? I see what the problem is. Yeah, when we promoted our, our uh, name attribute to points here, we no longer have it on prims, and we should have that on prims in order to, uh, in order to repack it here. All right, this is a little bit of a messy setup. We already unpacked our, our big geometry, so we don't need to unpack it again. So we can get rid of that. But anytime we pack up this geo, we want to make sure that name attribute is on primitives. So let's push it back up to prims here. Go from points to prims, select that name attribute. And now we should have some better names. Okay, that's more like it. Sorry if this particular demo is a little bit messy. It's not a workflow I typically use, so I'm kind of figuring this one out as I go. Um, normally, I just you know delete out the tiny pieces instead of absorbing them. But if we compare this exploded view, you can see we have a lot of little detached pieces here. Whereas here, we have a lot of those small pieces attached to their neighbors. And we can adjust this effect with the measure fracture size threshold. If we raise that up, you'll see more and more of these small pieces attached to their nearest neighbor. Maybe we'll go even higher to see what that effect looks like. And you can gradually turn this up and yeah, attach more and more pieces to their neighbors and reduce the number of little pieces in your simulation. So that will, could certainly optimize things quite a bit. In this particular case, we have 142 pieces in this end result compared to uh, 500 pieces in our original input. Now I know this is a little bit messy here. Um, you could potentially do an attribute transfer just based on primitives and avoid a whole bunch of this attribute promoting up and down. Um, I tend to like uh, just or transferring attributes onto packed object points. 
But yeah, you could certainly give this a try if you'd like and just transfer based on primitives and avoid some of these promotion steps. But the general idea is there, you know, if just the, uh, yeah, the transferring of names from the big pieces to the little ones. Let's see. Looks like we still don't have any questions in the chat. Um, so let's move on to some glass fracturing perhaps. Now, actually, before we talk about, you know, bespoke glass fractures, maybe I'll just talk about RBD, or RBD material fracture a little bit in general. Let's just create a little bit of test geometry, maybe a big concrete slab here. We'll make this maybe 10 by 0.5 by 10. It'll do the trick. And let's drop in our RBD material fracture node and connect our box to that. And let's say we're trying to do a concrete fracture. So if you display the results of that RBD material fracture, let's turn wireframe on shaded and maybe do an exploded view on that. Any time that we're going to change a parameter on here, we need to let the fracture run. So let's say maybe we want to add some extra detail. So I'd turn on some edge detailing like so. See, we have to wait for this to run to see what our starting point looks like. And every time you want to change one of these parameters, you once again have to wait for it to run and etc. And this can be a pretty slow way of working. Um, this is why I generally prefer to just use my cutter generator to create some really nice, interesting cutters because you can really see what it looks like without waiting for it to cook every time. And now we're starting to get some decent results here. That looks, looks pretty cool. Um, but it, and this is a very simple box and there's still a bit of a waiting process here. Uh, waiting for that box fracture to cook. Whereas if you compare that to working with the cutter, geonet, or cutter generator, we can see exactly what our cutters are going to look like before we run our fracture. So these, um, these sizes are pretty extreme defaults for working at the scale. Maybe you go down to a uh, large amplitude of 30, maybe a couple hundred for the resolution. Maybe take that large size down even more and turn on trim outside object. And you can see how we can really start to art direct those shapes before, um, before the fractures actually run. Looks like we need a little extra padding here. And yeah, this tends to be my preferred workflow because you have a lot of ability to art direct it. Although these, uh, these default settings are a little bit extreme for such a small object here. But yeah, I find this much easier to work with. Uh, the feedback that I've gotten from students so far is that they tend to prefer this as well. Um, and of course you can feel free to experiment with both. And some of the other features in the RBD material fracture can be quite cool. Um, like it does generate some interesting uh, glass details. But once again, this is a case where, and maybe this has changed a bit in 17.5, um, but I find it not very intuitive to control some of these uh, you know, art directable parameters here. For example, if we want to uh, just change the, the impact size here, if you want to, um, yeah, this impact spread seems like that should change the size in a predictable way. Uh, but the way that all these discontinuities and minimum width and impact spread all work together, in my opinion, it's not the most intuitive thing. So it's hard to say, you know, exactly 
what you would want to use parameter wise to art director results here. You can um, make this a bit more regular by turning down that discontinuity. That discontinuity controls some of this offsetting and those patterns here. But the biggest problem with using RBD material fracture is that in production, you tend to get lots of notes on exactly how your fracture is supposed to look. And if they want just a slight difference in, let's say, the shape of this ring here, you might have a hard time dialing in just that exact change with the controls that you have available. So I tend to prefer to scatter my own geometry to do glass fractures. So one cool trick to generate some nice controllable rings is using a ramp on the randomize. Let's drop in another box here for a glass example. Maybe make that 15 by 8. Make it a bit skinnier as well. Um, assume PB Hundari is uh, Prem. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, he, he asked, how do you decide to use either Boolean fracture or Voronoi fracture in production? And I almost always default to Boolean. Um, there are very few cases where I use Voronoi at this point. An exception might be wood, but we don't have to do wood fractures all that often. Um, that, I mean, maybe it's just the type of shows I've been on, but wood fractures pop up um, fairly rarely. Um, but yeah, for almost everything, I will use Booleans. One exception of that, though, I can show after I do a primary glass fracture here, there is um, a common case where you want to use Boolean and Voronoi together, and that's to create, I'm not sure if it's like safety glass or if it's a tempered glass thing, but when you get lots of little glass bits on the cracked surface. So if we start with generating some glass shards, <clears throat> I'll just start by scattering one random point as a source here. Drop in a scatter and change the force total count to one. It's probably pretty small for, for the stream here. Let's turn that up a bit. And template our box. Maybe play around with the global seed until it's in a place where, um, where we want it. So that, that looks like a decent starting point. So to create the radial rings for a bespoke glass fracture, I'll just start by dropping in a copy and transform to create the number of points that represent the number of rings I'd want. So let's say we want to generate maybe 15 rings. And then for each of these rings, I'm going to copy a tube. And I'll just use a copy stamp for this. Connect the tube to the left and the points to the right. And we can change the orientation of the tube to match the glass. So that'll be the x-axis. And I'll switch this to polys. And we can use a randomize to control the scale of all of these tubes. But we're not just going to make it completely random. We're going to set it up with a ramp so that we can control the distribution of them. So this randomize, we're going to adjust the scale attribute. And I'll switch this distribution to, uh, where is it, custom ramp. And maybe I'll just give it, um, I guess we can leave it as a three-dimensional ramp. That works. And if you display our copy results, you can see this is randomizing every single x, y, and z dimension of our scale attribute. The copy shop knows to look for that scale automatically. Um, but Typically, I would just want to scale this in, in this case, uh, Z and Y. So I'll drop in a wrangle node afterwards. I'll just do a point wrangle since we're processing these scatter points. We have 15 points stacked on top of each other. And I'll call this wrangle scale tweak. And I'll say um, 
we want the x scale to always be 1. So scale dot x equals 1. If we display the copy node and then bypass that, you can see that prevents this from squishing down our tubes in that dimension. And then I'll say at scale dot y equals scale dot z. So that'll force it to always use the same value for both of those. Now in our randomize here, which I'll call randomize scale, you can adjust the uh, min and max uh, scale values by turning on these two options here, the fit value zero and the fit value one. So maybe we want the maximum to be something like eight. Maybe that's a little extreme for this. Let's try four, maybe six. Six looks pretty good for this. And let's expand the ramp control so we can adjust that a little bit more easily. And I'll, I guess I'll leave all three of those in here for now. now right now we have a fairly even distribution through here, but we often want more of these rings closer to the center of our object and fewer further away. So I'll select this furthest away point, this point all the way at um, you know, a value of one, and I'll switch that interpolation to linear. Maybe I'll switch, need to switch the middle one to linear as well. That'll give us a straight line there. And then when you create a steep curve here toward the end of that ramp, that means fewer of our points will fall at this point of the spectrum. So we'll get fewer of those big rings. Looks like, yeah. Looks like it's uh, removing more of the big rings than I would expect it to. But yeah, you can play around with this to control exactly where the distribution of those rings are. If you have something like this, then most of these points are going to get some really tiny small values and you'll get tons of rings toward the center there and fewer as it gets further away. And this is a very nice art directable way of, of controlling you know, where all of the rings are. It's getting a little bit silly with the number of points that we have here. Let's delete some of those. This will let me. Okay, there we go. And of course, if you don't like the specific distribution, we could go to our global seed and change that until you get something that you like a bit more. It's a little bit annoying that the seed is on a separate, um, separate tab. I'd probably prefer it to all be on the same tab here. And you'll notice that as it gets further away from the center, uh, the resolution of the ring turns into more of a problem since the tubes are at a fixed resolution and as it gets further away, uh, we'll need a whole lot more resolution to preserve some smoothness on those tubes. Let's actually, let's raise the minimum value a little bit. Lower that to five. Yeah, that'll be a decent starting point. And we can use a copy stamping to adjust the tube resolution as those rings get bigger. So on this tube here, I'm going to, well, first we have to enable stamping on our copy node. If you turn on stamp inputs, and if you want to stamp a value from uh, your input points. In this case, we have the scale available. Or actually, let's set up a new attribute for the resolution here. So we'll say, we'll create a new attribute on our points called divisions. And we can base that division size on the minimum and maximum in our randomized. So if you go to your randomized scale, right click on fit value zero, and we can paste that relative reference into our expression here. This will automatically paste in, this is a string reference, but since this is a, a number value, it's a float field, you can just get rid of the CHS and change it to CH. You can get rid of those back ticks around it. 
we can just use this normal channel lookup in this expression here. And we're going to remap the scale between the minimum and maximum uh, possible scale. So we can base the number of divisions on our scale.z. We'll remap it between this minimum value that we've copied a uh, channel reference to up through the maximum value that that can be. And this, um, this maximum value, you just have to change that 0 to 1 since that's the name of this other parameter. It's the same thing, just 1 instead of 0. And then you can put in values for the minimum and maximum divisions for that tube. So maybe we'll go from 10 divisions up through 100. And now we've set up this divisions uh, attribute on these points here. And it looks like just one point, but that's actually all, I think, 15 points that we set up. If I add a jitter, you can see all of those points there. Now if we go back and view our copy sop, we can stamp our divisions onto our tube. Now what the stamping does is it essentially um, allows us to access attributes from our points via this stamp expression. So we can change the number of columns based on that division attribute we set up. And if you just type in stamp, this wants two strings and a float as an argument. The first string is a path to the copy sop. So that'll be dot dot slash copy two. And we want to grab the divisions attribute. And then the final argument is just a default value if it can't find that. So we could use a value of four as the default number of divisions. Now you can see they're all just getting that default number of divisions, which means our stamp expression's not working. It's either not finding that copy sup or this attribute. Now if you go back to our copy sops stamp tab here, we haven't specified any of the attributes from our points to be stamped onto our incoming geometry. So under attribute stamps, you can just add this divisions attribute that we set up, put that in here, call it divisions, and sure enough, you can see we've got um, a, a varying number of divisions based on the size of that object. So with this copy soft displayed, if you want to, you can go in and tweak the uh, different number of divisions. For example, if you want, you know, double the resolution on the outside, change that to 200 and control enter in there. And you can see this has changed to 200. Maybe I'll try turning it down to four on the inside to make it pretty obvious, just to show you that it is actually working properly although that's kind of a bit too low res for this case. So now we've got some decent uh, consistent resolution on those tubes. Now, I typically would generate some linear cutters in the same way. So we have our radial ones set up. Now let's generate some linear ones as well. So I can just uh, drop in another copy stop here We'll use the same source point. And maybe this time we just, well, I guess we can still generate 15 uh, linear cutters to begin with. And for this one, we're just going to copy some grid geometry onto these points. So just create a grid. And we'll do another copy stamp. You might not need a stamp for this one, but we can use a copy stamp just in case we need that functionality. And uh, for this one, I'm going to do some randomly rotated normals. So let's drop in another randomize. <clears throat> we'll set the attribute name on the randomize to N. And right now, it's uh, varying the normal in every single direction. 
but it's also a very limited range on that variance. So I'll change the minimum from zero to minus one in every dimension. Because that's the, you know, the valid range for normal values. And right now it's still uh, just randomly rotating it everywhere. It's in full 360 degrees now, but we just want to limit this to um, you know, rotating on the same plane as our glass surface. So I'm just going to drop in another wrangle node to process that normal. In this case, let's set the normal uh, dot, let's see, we'll try which, which, amp, which direction is this? We want it to vary Y and Z, so X would be zero. And then we'll say at N equals normalize at N. So now you can see this is just restricting our random normals to the, um, to the axis that we want it. Maybe I'll just rename that wrangle, tweak N. And you'll notice these grids are not long enough yet, so we can just adjust the size of these. Let's increase the length there, and they don't need to be nearly as wide. Maybe a value of two is fine. You can also solid template your, your glass pane here in order to view things a little bit better if you'd like. And it looks like these values are pretty decent. We'll need to use a whole lot more resolution, of course. It's a bit low res right now. So maybe I'll try 100 divisions like so. And now we've got our linear cuts and we have our radials. So we can merge these together and see what that looks like combined. And that looks like it would make a pretty good uh, Boolean cut. So let's just drop in our, uh, I guess we could use our shatter HDA instead of just the regular Boolean. Connect our box up to that and our cutters. And actually this probably won't work since we don't have any names applied to our geometry. So I'll just drop in a primitive wrangle to give this a name to loop over, I'll say name equals glass. Let the primitive wrangle to be called set name. Drop it before our shatter. And it looks like that's running properly. Let's do an exploded view to see what that looks like. Cool. So right now everything is looking very straight and regular. Um, we could just simply drop in a mountain node to start tweaking some of these shapes a bit. Um, oftentimes people go a little bit too wavy with their glass cracks. Um, glass tends to fracture into some pretty straight and smooth shapes often. Um, depends on the type of glass. But yeah, it, glass does tend to be one of those things that gets, um, yeah, it takes a while to dial in a look that people are happy with in production. And in my experience, it often needs to be a lot straighter than people suspect it's supposed to be. Let's just view our cutters for the moment. Maybe turn our element size up a bit, like so. That looks pretty decent just to get some some waves on there. That makes it a little bit more interesting. We could probably go with a little bit more detail on this, but that looks like a pretty decent starting point. Although at the very center here, we don't have our pieces coming to, um, coming to a point anymore at the very middle. And oftentimes it's nice for these to all really converge to a very well-defined point. So you might want to have some fall off on this noise based on the distance from that point. So let's set up an attribute to control that. Let's, um, let's see a couple of ways we could do this. We could just do this with a wrangle 
on our, um, our cutters based on the scatter point here. So I'll just drop in a wrangle and I'll place this on, we could place it on all of our cutters, I suppose. Yeah, we, let's do that. Set up this on everything. I'll call this distance and we'll connect our scatter point to that. And the distance, uh, well, this attribute wrangle is going to run over all of our points. Then for each point in our cutter geometry, we're going to measure the distance to this input point that we've connected to the second input of the wrangle. So we'll say f at dist equals length of at p minus uh, the, the point position coming into that uh, second input. So that will be point from input number one, the position p of that point, and we'll grab point number zero. Uh, if you're having a hard time seeing any of these expressions, just let me know and I can paste them into the chat. So let's check our spreadsheet to see if we're getting something that looks reasonable for those distance values. And that looks about right, values of zero up through 15. Um, if you want to visualize this, you can. You could drop in a color sop and set this to ramp from attribute and we'll uh, call the attribute distance. Do we call it distance or dist? Looks like we called it dist. So that has to match exactly. And right now this is defaulting for a range of zero to one. Let's set that from zero to 15. And maybe switch this to flat shaded, see if that's any more obvious. Hmm, it doesn't look very obvious from that visualization there. We can also check this with a blast. I would expect this um, to be a bit more obvious. Let's try changing the color to see if that helps. Let's set the color at the center to be red. Okay, that, that's a bit more obvious there. Maybe vary it from red to green. Or we could try black as well. All right, so it looks like that's a little bit more clear. Sometimes when you're visualizing things with color, the uh, black and white can be a bit more confusing to look at since you know that will uh, could potentially just look like lighting effects on the surface. But now that we have this distance set up, we can uh, we could do a blend back to its original position. So I like doing uh, blend shapes in a wrangle node, and you know, notice we're doing a lot with wrangle nodes. Um, I know wrangles can be intimidating for people that haven't done much programming but hopefully we're using small enough little snippets that the non-programmers will slowly get used to it. Um, there is this blend shape in Houdini, but unless they've changed something with 17.5, we can't override the blends with um, an attribute on the geometry. As far as I know, they haven't updated that. I know it's been something I've been hoping for for a while. But in a wrangle, we can set up a very quick one-line blend shape. So if we connect our regular geometry into the first input and our mountain into the second, then we can use a, a function called lerp to blend between the two inputs. So we'll say at p equals lerp, stands for linear interpolation. And we'll set that to at p, and for the second argument, we'll look up the position from input one, which has the noise on it. So input one, position p, from point at pt num. And then this lerp needs a final value that will be a bias between the two. So essentially it tells us which, um, which point in the blend between these two values we want to output. If I put in a value of zero, it does nothing. So that will entirely use our first, um, our first value P. If I put in a value of one, then that'll entirely use 
the mount and point position from the second argument here. If I use 0.5, it'll go halfway in between. And you can also go above and below uh, 0 and 1. So if we go back to 1, we can also overdrive this, go to 2, which will essentially give us double the mountain noise, if that's something you want to do. But instead of just setting this to a given value, we can use the distance to determine how much of the noise we're going to use. So let's remap that, oh, let's see. Oh, we're on the wrong wrangle here. So let's remap our distance value to determine what that mix bias is going to be. So I'll just create a local variable, say float mix equals, and I'll use a fit function to remap that distance. So we'll fit dist from maybe zero to, let's see, where we, wherever we want to uh, have full amounts of our noise, we'll try a value of just one to begin with. And then for the uh, last two values of our fit function, we'll specify the matching blend amounts. So at a distance of zero, and we can just use zero for the blend, and a distance of one, we'll just use one for the blend. Now for this, you could very well just use a fit zero one function instead um, if we're you know, using distances of zero and one, but if you want to change the distances to anything else besides exactly zero and exactly one, then you'll have to use this fit. Now in, now in our loop function, let's replace that two with this new mix variable. And we can bypass this wrangle on and off. Actually, this will be a bit more obvious if we switch our inputs perhaps. Yeah, let's switch our inputs. Um, is this working like I expect to? No, looks like it's not. What are we doing wrong here? Let's do a quick blast on distance to make sure this looks like the distance is working correctly. I'll say blast if at dist is less than one. And anytime you do a blast based on an attribute, you have to, or at least on a point attribute, you have to set that, um, the group type to points. So that looks correct. Now I'm going to switch the order of these inputs so that the mountain gets blended out by this wrangle. And let's revisit this mixing to see if I, if I mixed this up here. <laughs> um, so let's, let's say if we have a value, a, a mix value of zero, so distance of zero gives us a mix value of zero. So we'll want, let's try flipping this. A distance of zero gives us a value of one. And a distance of one gives us a mix value of zero. Let's try increasing our distance amount here from zero to five. There we go. That's making it a bit more obvious. It looks like our distance values were just no good. So as we, uh, as we increase our distance here, you can see that noise gets reduced as we get further and further away. And if you want a more convenient way of controlling this than just changing the values manually in your code, you can set up um, a parameter here. So in our, our mix fit, I'll change the value of 10 to be, uh, we'll type in CHF, and I'll, I'll just put in maybe max underscore distance. And then when you have, whenever you type in CHF and then hit this little thing here, that will automatically create a parameter for you to control the effect. Right now, this is defaulting to zero to one. Um, we can change the range in our parameter interface if we want to. In this case, I'll change it to go from zero to 20 and apply that. 
So now we have this max distance slider that we can use to control the fall off of that there. We can do this for the minimum distance too. So right now we're controlling the distance at which full amount of noise is being applied. Uh, we can also replace the zero with CHF for min distance. No worry, Prems. Um, so yeah, we'll add the min distance there, add that extra parameter. I tend to like moving those generated parameters to the top here. Once again, I'll change this from zero to 15 or something, or maybe 20 just to match what I have set up on the other uh, parameter. So that'll control where the, uh, where the uh, noise starts being factored in. So with this set to 0.94 how it is right now, it'll use none of our noise until we get 0.94 units away from that center there. And this is just a nice way of art directing the look of your fractures. And uh, having immediate access to your cutters is really nice instead of using sort of semi black box procedural things like the RBD material fracture because if your super director says they just want this one ring slightly adjusted, it's much more easy to you know, just manually shift around all of your cutters here. It would be much harder to do that with some of these like full on uh, somewhat black box approaches like you get with the RBD material fracture. And we can take a look at the results from this and you can see that gives us that nice, um, nice defined impact point there. Yeah, we'll take that down to zero, see what it looks like. Yeah, you can kind of art direct this as much as you would like. Looks like we're about to the end of our time here. Um, so for everyone else watching the recording later, um, if there are any things that you would like me to cover, uh, in the live sessions and you can't make it to the session yourself, that's totally fine. I understand people are, you know, various places all over the world and the timing doesn't work for everybody, but definitely feel free to post in the forums any questions that you have uh, that you'd like me to review in the live sessions, um, or you could send me a private email if you'd like. And hope everything goes well with doing the full building fracture this week. And yep, if you have any questions or problems, post in the forum or drop me a line. And I look forward to seeing what everybody's full building fractures look like. <clears> hmm. <throat>